folks. Sorry I can't be with you today. I got that dental appointment, and boy, I can't wait. Wow, that'll be great. But anyway, uh, here are the middle colonies, or sometimes called the restoration colonies. Here you see that opening slide that goes over what AP expects you guys to know. Remember, how are the different regions of colonies different? How does geography, environment play a role in that? Why is that significant? What does that mean for the future? Those are the things you need to be thinking about. Alrighty, so the middle or restoration colonies. So here we go, we look at the map. This is the AP key concept. They had a flourishing, that means doing well, export economy. So these were about exporting stuff. Cereal crops, think of the cereals you have. That's right, Lucky Charms, Cheetos, Wheaties, all those kind of things. Um, basically wheat and, and barley and those kind of things. And it's gonna, they're gonna have a broad, broad range of migrants. The thing to remember, this is by far the most diverse area. Whereas New England is pretty much only English people, whereas the Southern colonies are pretty much only English people and African-Americans. What you have here um, are uh, a large group of European migrants from all over the place. So it's great cultural, ethnic, religious diversity, and as you'll see, a lot of religious tolerance and even tolerance for the Indians. Yeah, imagine that. So what colonies are we talking about here? We got New York, remember? We talked about it. It had been Dutch. There you see New York, number five. We got New Jersey, okay? There's New Jersey. You see it popping up just a little bit south of, uh, of New York. Then you got Pinsa. Get down tonight. That's right, Pinsa, get down, Vania. Get down, Vania. Okay, anyway. And you got Delaware. There's your Delaware. It's that little kind of kind of smaller version of New Hampshire down there, okay? Not the Maryland part. And that is, of course, where uh, the vice presidential, our former vice president, now presidential candidate, uh, Bill By or Joe Biden is from. Sorry, y'all, it's very early in the morning. Okay, so let's look at the restoration here. Uh, that little sound you heard, that was from the execution of King Charles I after the English Civil War, which lasted between 1642 and 1651. No, you don't need to know that. Um, in 1649, King Charles I was executed. Oliver Cromwell, who you see here, was executed. Wish I could tell you some stories about Cromwell's body and stuff. Maybe I will at another time. We don't have time for that. Just needless to say, or suffice to say, that his head and skull disappeared for a long time. Here you see some rare and historical footage of Charles I going to his death. There you watch Oliver Cromwell watching as King Charles I becomes somewhat shorter. Yeah. You can see why the guillotine was considered an improvement, y'all, because the ax didn't always work the first time, okay? Sometimes it took more than one. So Cromwell and especially his son, Richard, were so, so awful. How awful were they? Well, they were so awful that the people of England, after uh, the son's death, went over to, uh, to France and they asked Charles, the son, to come back. And so when he comes back, he restores the monarchy, hence the term restoration. And here you see King Charles II looking good there in that red and white outfit. Uh, and so what he's going to do is those people who had supported him, who had continued to support his father despite all the bad, um, he is going to uh, reward those supporters with this territory. I mean, you know, giving them land and stuff. One of the first is going to be William Pinton. Um, interestingly enough, my father swears, or did swear, um, that our family had a connection to him. I've not been able to find it. Um, we do have some connection to some Quakers, the Foxes, but I've not found any connection to William Penn. So maybe that story was confused by, by the foxes. But anyway, that was the name of a family. So he was a very aristocratic guy. Um, he was the son of an Admiral Penn, one of the, the great English admirals of all time. The man had won Jamaica from Spain and uh, had paid for a lot of it with his own money, the invasion, the Navy part, all that kind of stuff. And so the king owed him a lot of money. So William Penn, the son, he goes off. Uh, he does his military time. And then he comes back a Quaker. Now, a Quaker is a pacifist, y'all. They don't believe in fighting. And I kid you not, when he came back, man, his dad gave him a beat down. It's like, you what? A pacifist? I'll show you nonviolence and beat the you-know-what out of the poor dude. So basically what happens is 
he goes to the king, and he never would take off his hat to the king because Quakers don't take off their hats to anybody. They believe everybody is equal. In fact, Charles would take his hat off to him saying, he says, why do you do that? And uh, Penn would say, and he said, well, because custom dictates that at least one of us in this room should have his hat off. So the king would take his hat off to Penn. But anyway, he's like, look, I got an idea. You owe my dad a lot of money. My dad's dead now um, because of this Jamaica Mon thing. And so how about this? You give me and my fellow Quakers uh, some land, you know, kind of like you guys did with uh, Maryland for the uh, Catholics, except this is going to work, right? And so Penn, I mean, so he says, all right, but I have one request, Charles said. I am going to name it in, in honor of your father. I am going to call it Pennsylvania, meaning in Latin, Pennsylvania. And Penn's like, man, don't do that. Everybody will think I named it after myself. That's not how I roll. But guess what? But he accepted it. And guess what? Everybody still thinks William Penn named it after himself when indeed it was named for him by his father. Okay? Or for his father. So they advertised, y'all. But I know this is going to sound like crackhead talk. Like, that's crazy talk, Mr. D. Yep. They used honesty. They didn't like say, come here, it is the Garden of Eden. No, it's better than the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden looks enviously at what where we live. No, this is actually a good place, and they were honest. And so, man, they get tons of people coming there. Believe it or not, honesty actually worked. They were very generous with the land they gave away, okay? Lots of immigrants from all over Europe are going to come there. So it becomes the most, it becomes the best advertised. You often hear that term. And, of course, as AP says, the most ethnically, religiously diverse, and ultimately, the most successful colony. So yeah, give it up to Pennsylvania. Woo, Pennsylvania. Woo. Okay, anyway, so let's look at their geography, their climate, and of course, eventually, that's impact on the economy for this region. First of all, the climate is milder than New England, not nearly as cold, right? Okay, so it's not as bad. It's not going to be hot as the South. Um, I like to think of the middle colonies, y'all, as just that. It's sort of like the Goldilocks colonies, right? Not too hot, not too cold, but just right, okay? So it's milder than there. The winters aren't as long. They aren't as severe. The soil is very fertile. Look, man, you can see right there how fertile that soil is. It is just growing right out of the heart of the dirt there. You don't need a green thumb to grow anything there, right? I have sort of the opposite of that. I've got sort of the thumb of death, y'all. I kill plastic plants, okay? Um, now, these colonies are going to become known as the bread colonies or the grain colonies because they grow all these things like oats and wheat and barley and things like that. In fact, it's no accident that you have Quaker oats, right, still to this day. See the, see the Quaker on it, right, with this cool hat? Uh, it is no accident that Quaker oats come from there. All righty. Now, also, the rivers are going to help a great deal. They're very broad, as you can see there, pretty broad pretty navigable. You can go up and down them. That's what that term means. And that's going to help out trade quite a bit. Whereas the New England rivers, and we didn't really talk about this, the New England rivers y'all are pretty fast and pretty rough for the, for the most part, except for the Connecticut River Valley, one of the few fertile areas. Um, the rivers are going to be um, up in New England. They're going to be great later for um, harnessing um, power uh, to use to, for, um, to, to work in the factories and things like that, the mills that they build along there. Okay, so there you go. Mild climate, fertile soil leads to them being known as the bread or grain colonies, which they used for themselves, but also they exported most of it. All right, so the economic activities are going to come out of here, y'all. Industry, once again, you see that pretty much everywhere because, you know, we still had our trees, right? We hadn't cut them down like the Europeans had. And of course, what is this going to foster? Just like in New England, it's going to foster shipbuilding. Um, the farms are medium sized. Once again, go with the Goldilocks thing. Um, as I was saying, it's not too hot, not too cold up there. What we have there is the farms aren't too big, like the plantations that you have in the South, but they're not the tiny farms that you have in New England. So they're going to specialize in growing wheat, corn, oats, barley for export. And they even get a little bit of iron production going there, y'all, in Pennsylvania. You see a little uh, early forge down here where they're making iron ore. And um, that is uh, going to be a place called Valley Forge where George, where George Washington will have to spend a very cold winter. It was an exceptionally cold winter with his troops. Okay. Now the religions, 
The thing to remember here is it's a little bit of everything. First of all, you got the Quakers that come there under William Penn. Um, and they also settle in Delaware. They settle in New Jersey. Um, they're very religiously tolerant. Um, everybody um, except Catholics will be given rights. Initially, Catholics were given rights, and then there's a lot of pressure put on them, um, on the officials, and they do take some of those rights away from the Catholics. But once again, pretty much all Protestant Christianity, uh, Christianity faiths were tolerant, or Christian faiths were. Now, the Pennsylvania Dutch are an interesting group. Remember, the word Deutsch is the word for German in German, right? And so when these people came over and people asked, hey, man, where are you from? They said, oh, I'm Deutsch. And they said, oh, Dutch, like Holland. Hey, I got a friend in Amsterdam. You know him? You like tulips? Okay. You like that new Amsterdam cheese? Um, and like, no, nine, nine, Dutch, Deutsch. Like, yeah, I know Dutch, right? And so that has been a sense of confusion. Now, a lot of these folks today are Amish. Um, Indiana and Pennsylvania are the leaders uh, in having Amish people. This is an interesting religious sect, a group that re um, um, rejects modernity. They reject electricity. They reject cars, all those kind of things. They lead a very, very simple life. You see them dressing black here. The men tend to wear beards. The ladies dress like this. Um, it's a very, very sort of simple life. Now, ironically, some of them work and and work doing electronics. And like in Indiana, they build like big giant um, vans and cruisers and things like that. But then they go back home to their home where they don't have any of those kind of things. So they kind of like to live life simply. They, they're famous for riding around in their buggies in Pennsylvania um, from making great furniture and stuff. So it's going to be one of those interesting religious sects that is allowed to stay in America and allowed to stay like it is. And we're going to become known for that kind of thing. Okay. Right. Genius. Genius. Uh, Coolio actually got mad at him for that. I don't know if you guys remember the original Gangsta Paradise. Got mad at him using the song. Later they worked out a deal. And of course it helped sales of Gangsta Paradise as well too. So if you don't know Gangsta Paradise, you might want to watch that. Um, maybe not around your parents, whatever. But, um, and you'll understand the song a little bit better and especially the video. But they're a fascinating group, y'all. I got to see them when I lived in Indiana and, uh, and um, you know, you gotta respect their uh, commitment to their ideals in this, uh, this world of ours today. Now the Dutch, we already talked about them, right? They settled what had been um, New Netherlands, New Amsterdam. So they keep their Dutch reformed church up there. You got Lutherans in New Jersey. But one of the key groups that's gonna come here, y'all, is the group called the Scots-Irish, or as Americans like to call them, Scotch-Irish. These were people who had made their way to Northern Ireland, or what is today Northern Ireland, um, and uh, not been very well received there or treated very well by the English. And so they eventually leave Ireland uh, and make their way here, and they bring Presbyterianism and also a great, great deal of hatred towards the English. They're going to be some of our biggest supporters in the revolution, um, and provide us with some of our greatest uh, military and political leaders later on. They're a fascinating group, and I'm happy to say my mother's side of the family, the Watsons, Scotch-Irish. So I can, you know, talk about them that way. So let's talk about these Quakers. Notice the little icon there, y'all, the, the little um, button I've got. It's got the little Quaker Oats guy. Why are they called Quakers? Well, during their ceremonies, apparently they would kind of quiver. They would kind of shake. They would kind of quake, hence the term. Quakers, right? They offended a lot of religious people, and they def they offended secular. That means worldly, non-church people in England. So why were they so hated, right? Well, first of all, they wouldn't pay taxes. Now, in those days, the taxes went to support the Church of England. They kind of had this crazy idea. Hey, like, if we don't go to that church, like, why should we pay to support it? <laughs> crazy talk again, okay? They met without a paid clergy. In other words, they didn't pay all their church officials, which Mr. D misspelled there, officials. Should be an I and then an A. I'm sorry about that, y'all. They also believed in equality. They didn't believe in slavery, although it since has been discovered in a disappointing way that William Penn did at one time have some slaves. Hate to hear that. But um, the thing is, they believed everybody were children of God, men and women, black and white. So they refused to treat these upper class people with deference. They refused to treat lower class people 
uh, badly, right? They thought everybody was equal. Um, they wore their hats all the time. They wouldn't take them off as a sign of respect to anybody or anything. Everybody was addressed the same way. Back in those days, y'all, betters than you were supposed to be addressed in a different way, sirs and ma'ams and things like that. But they saw everybody, they, they called everybody thee and thou. No matter how poor, no matter how wealthy you were, you were treated the same way. I kind of like these folks, y'all. Maybe it's because of the family background, I got to say. And in fact, you know, they found a town around here. And since the real name of the Quakers was the Society of Friends, and they addressed each other as friends, I wonder in what wooded area founded by friends, they would what they would have called that town nearby. Huh. Friends, friends. Friendswood, yeah, that's a ticket, believe it or not. Yes, Friendswood, settled by Quakers, hence the term Friendswood. And they wouldn't, boy, Mr. D. Spelling was great here this day. Um, they wouldn't take oaths. They wouldn't swear to God. And this is why people said you can't trust them. If they won't swear to God, how do we know they're not lying? And in fact, even to this day, y'all, in our Constitution, we have a thing that says when the president takes the oath of office, he or she will say, I swear um, to, you know, whatever. Well, guess what? We also have, they can say, I affirm if they don't want to say swear. Why is that? That is a provision for Quakers. Now, we've only had two Quakers presidents, two Quaker presidents, uh, Herbert Hoover, who did. Uh, I don't know. I think he might have said affirm. I'm not sure. And Richard Nixon, um, believe it or not, was a Quaker, or at least his mother had been, and he was raised a Quaker didn't act very Quakerish, but you know, whatever. Okay. That sometimes happens. And the thing that really bugged people, they were pacifist, meaning they were opposed to war. Okay. So the middle, middle colony demographics, the major ethnic groups, by far the most diverse of all regions, man, you got your Dutch in New York, you got your Germans in Pennsylvania, you got your British uh, Quakers in Pennsylvania as well. You got these Scotch Irish people and they went right to the frontier, y'all. They went right to the Appalachian Mountains where they caused all sorts of problems, let me tell you. Okay. You do have more Africans brought there than in New England because they did use them on the farms, but they don't need the massive amounts of, of these humans, uh, these enslaved human beings, as they did uh, down in the South. Okay. Now, Penn is going to be famous for his treatment of Indians. He got along with the Indians. Why? Well, first of all, he had this crazy idea. Like, rather than take the land, like, why don't we pay them for them? And remember, they're pacifists, so they're not going to fight the Indians. They honored the treaties that they made. What? That's crazy talk, Mr. D. No, they made deals with the Indians, and then they kept it. Now, there is one exception. It was kind of nasty here, y'all. It was called the Walking Treaty. The Indians had agreed to give... Uh, a certain group of guys land. Now, the way they measured it was kind of weird. As far as a man can walk in a day, by as far as a man can walk, you know, in this other direction in a day or whatever. And so what did the uh, the whites do, the English guys? They hired kind of like an early marathoner, y'all. I kid you not, man. And so what happened is the dude got up. I mean, he waited for the first crack of sun and then boom, he took off walking. He's like, you, you run. <laughs> You're not walking, you're running, you know? And he's like, no, I'm walking, you know? And he was doing like the power walking kind of thing. And he got a lot more miles out of it than he should have. So the Indians felt burned. And later they decided to get revenge on the guy. And they came to his home, his cabin, and uh, they killed his whole family. But guess what? <laughs> he happened to be out there. I guess he had errands to run. And, you know, that's a joke, but it was actually a true story. Okay. And here you see that. And over here, y'all, you see something called wampum. Now, Indians didn't have money per se, and this has often been mischaracterized as money. But what it is, y'all, it's tiny little shells here. And Indians use this to signify agreements. Now, they didn't have writing, but if you notice here, y'all, you've got, it looks like an M, but a closer inspection is actually an Indian and a white man shaking hands, making peace. Indians were so trusted. How trusted were they, Mr. D? that they actually could live as babysitters. And uh, believe it or not, some Indians, like the Savannah Indians I'll talk about in the South, they actually tried to come there. And Indians migrated to Pennsylvania. I mean, you not only had immigrants, y'all, coming from Europe, you had immigrants or migrants within the, in the future United States moving to Pennsylvania. That is Indians because Penn had such a good reputation there. 
So some other miscellaneous information, great deal of religious tolerance, great deal of ethnic diversity, okay, among these people, okay. Pennsylvania Constitution is by far the most democratic, along with that of Rhode Island, where essentially everybody, including Catholics initially, every Christian, I should say, everybody could vote, every Christian male could vote, even Catholics, although eventually do have to take that. Um, nobody, except maybe the French, maybe even, well, I don't want to say better than the French, but almost nobody, y'all, had the type of good relations with Native Americans. Almost no English colonies can say that. The government of Pennsylvania, they elected an assembly. Uh, um, they had a, an assembly that was elected by those who own land, but the church was not supported by, uh, I mean, they had churches, but there was no established church. Remember, religious toleration. Also, y'all, they will establish the first college, the College of Pennsylvania, um, Penn State today, um, that is not was not created basically to uh, educate ministers, although I'm sure it did, but that wasn't its sole purpose. It was non-denominational. It wasn't connected to a specific church, like Harvard was for the Congregationalist or the Puritanist, right? Princeton is going to be for uh, the Presbyterians, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, Brown is for the Baptist, uh, and so forth and so on. Now, later, they were forced to deny the right to vote to Catholics and to Jews. The English government said, hey, you're going a little too far here. And so they did have to rescind that. But they tried, y'all. They tried. And Jews, notice that. The death penalty, you could only be executed for treason and murder. Now, you might go, Mr. D, that sounds pretty rough. you got to remember, if you went over to England during that time, there were 200 things that were called capital crimes. Why do we call them capital? Because it resulted in capital punishment. You could be executed for stealing bread. You could be executed for this and that. And like 200 different things, y'all. Um, you know, it was just, uh, it was ridiculous. So they're like, come on, man. You know, only do it if, if they're, you know, they commit treason against our country uh, or they murder somebody. So we look here, y'all, and Philadelphia is going to become one of the biggest growing cities in this area. It, of course, is in Pennsylvania. You see it, it starts out slow here when it's formed about 1675, but man, does it take off. And what does that say? Well, that toleration, all that kind of stuff that they did for the different groups, openness to migrants, honesty, brought people in. The only big town in the South is Charlestown in South Carolina, or Charleston as it eventually comes known. Notice it's very steady growth. You know, we could like figure out what is it, the angle here. We could figure out all that stuff that I remember kind of sort of from my math classes. New York kind of goes, but nothing grows like Pensacola down or Philadelphia, y'all, the city of brotherly love. And with that, y'all, I will close. So there is your presentation. Be sure to um, make sure you've watched the end of the one about the Puritans, about New England, and make sure you watch the one on um, the southernmost colonies and the West Indies. There was a copyright issue with the song I had on there, so I hope that's going to load correctly. Otherwise, I'm going to have to edit that and repost it because the song Georgia by Ray Charles was, was having some issues. So that's about it. Get this chart done. Mr. D misses seeing you virtually or in class. Take care, y'all. Wish me luck at the dentist day. Eh?